Okay, I'll be right back to help. Okay. Screen share. Right there. Screen sharing. Yep, that little guy. All right. and we can see it on Zoom. We can see it on Zoom. All right, excellent. <clears throat> okay, as Miss Katie Dolan was saying earlier, my name is Jacob McNamara. I am a doctor of chiropractic. And I practice with Dr. Julie McLaughlin um, over at uh, 900 North Shore Drive out in Lake Bluff. Uh, so come give us a visit if you ever get the chance. But today, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is stress. We're going to talk about stressing less, feeling better, and living better. So let's just take a little survey here. Who, by raise of hand, has ever felt stress? All right, that's what I figured about. And every hand is raised. Uh, it's very, very common. And um, we're going to talk about what types of stress there are and how to deal with it. So 99.5 Americans have experienced stress, especially this last year, almost two years now. Uh, it's probably even closer to 99.8, 99.9, let's be real. So what is stress exactly? So stress can be defined as really in the biological and a psychological sense as any type of stress that causes a physical or mental effect on the mind or body. So <clears throat> there's good stress and there's bad stress. Good stress we call eustress, bad stress we call distress. And the eustress is good, it can lead to positive things and can actually reduce some of that distress. So a survey by the American Psychological Association said that too often Americans are taking medications that may not work or be inappropriate for their mental health problems. A lot of times when we go see a doctor and they prescribe us a psychological medication to improve our depression symptoms, um, it's almost like a uh, crap toss where they are just kind of trying out, seeing what's work. It's, a, it's kind of a shotgun approach. And then they isolate what works best based on what's not working for you. Um, and what we wanna do is we wanna address the stress at the, not just the symptom size, but the cause of these symptoms. So um, this is a little bit of an old survey. Uh, it hasn't been updated this year, but it was predicted that by 2020, depression would be the number one cause of disability in the US. I looked it up and the CDC reported it's actually about the fourth cause um, with the main causes being musculoskeletal conditions, which is something that we deal with as chiropractors on a daily basis. But then there's also cardiovascular disease, which we also deal with from a functional medicine perspective, which I'll get into later. And uh, cancer would be the third with uh, uh, depression being the number one or the number four. And you can't medicate your way out of a problem you behave your way into. So a lot of the things we're talking about is behavior changes that we can start doing every day from when you leave here today to start uh, reducing those symptoms of stress. Um, at the time of this survey, it did say that neuropsychiatric disorders are the leading cause of disability, which again, it is like the fourth now. And it's counting for 18.7% of all years of life loss due to disability and premature mortality. So we wanna change that number. We wanna reduce the stress. So uh, we live longer and live happier and live better. So what are the top causes of stress in the US? Well, a lot of us can relate to this job pressure, money, health, relationships, pandemic made their way up in there and media overload. And media overload makes all of these exponentially worse. Um, from the survey, 77% of the uh, surveyors said that they have physical symptoms from stress. 73 said they're having psychological symptoms uh, of stress that are unrelated to their stress symptoms. Um, 33 defined themselves as extreme stress. And uh, 48 says that their stress has increased exponentially over the past five years. And the average cost that um, psychological orders due to stress costs as our country is 300 billion on average per year. And this was all from the American Psychological Association, American Institute. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the pandemic, AKA the stress demic. It's something we've all been de dealing with so we can all relate. It's really nice actually seeing you guys in person. So that is an awesome thing. Um, at least we're making progress. But during the pandemic, um, from this survey, from the Kaiser Family Foundations, they found that four out of 10 adults in the US have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder uh, throughout this time. They found that many adults are reporting negative impacts on their mental health and well-being, as well as some physical um, 
uh, symptoms as well, such as difficulty sleeping or eating. There's also a large increase in alcohol consumption or substance abuse. I'm sure we have all heard of that or know someone that's experienced that as well. And then a big worsening in chronic conditions, including chronic pain. A lot of these are due to stress actually increasing our symptoms of pain. Our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight response, is very deeply connected to pain uh, symptoms that we feel. And fight or flight is directly our stress response that we have. So <clears throat> that's part of it is due to that. Part of it's just due to everything shutting down, people having trouble making appointments and things like that. Uh, but the good news is we're here and we can help you out. And we'll move on. So do we live in a healthy or sick country? What do you guys think? Healthy, sick? I think so too. Stress and anxiety are a sign that we need to work on our fundamentals. Now these fundamentals are things that we can start doing every day, like I mentioned earlier, that can impact all, all forms of health, stress being the number one we're focusing on today. So there's five pillars I'm mainly gonna talk about today. That's think better, eat better, move better, feel better, and sleep better. I put sleep better at the top because that's like the main, most important in my opinion is that sleep. And stress affects all of this and all this affects stress. So let's start number one, we're gonna talk about thinking better. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna identify triggers. Some of these triggers might be things such as coronavirus. Some of them might be people such as politics. I'm sure we're all sick of hearing about some of that. Uh, places, traffic, just traveling. You know, There's been travel orders where we can't travel certain places and just dealing with stress of hotspots and things like that. And then when we discover these triggers, we need to ask ourselves why they are stressing us out. It's called interoception, trying to know why do we feel a certain way about what's happening in our environment. And we're gonna start with one small change at a time. And if you look in your packets, first I'm gonna start about the one page miracle. Now this is to build some of that interoception. What you're gonna do is you're gonna tell your brain what you want and you're gonna tell your, and you're gonna match the behavior to get it. <clears throat> so you don't have to do it now, you can do it when you get home. But what you are gonna do with these one page miracles is you're gonna to wanna to write down what's important to you, whether it's your relationships, your work, your finances, and just something great about yourself. And you're gonna write these things down. It's gonna you know, make a concrete thing that you can look at every day. And then we're gonna post it. I like to post it on the mirror. That's where I post mine. So I can look at that every day and it just reiterates my goals, aspirations, and things that just make me happy in life. And it's a great way to kind of get the dopamine. Dopamine's kind of that motivational neurotransmitter. It builds some of that up. So it really motivates for the day. and. Uh, allows us to feel good as well. So that's something that you guys can take home with you. Now something I'm gonna talk about is called autonomic negative thoughts. This is kind of our, uh, when our CPU goes into um, computer mode and just these thoughts come up and we don't know how to get them out of our head. They're also nicknamed ants, A-N-T. So there's nine different types of ants that I'm gonna talk about. The first one is the all or nothing thinking ant. This is that all things are either good or bad. Now we know we live in a non-binary world and there's a big gray area and that spectrum of where things are good versus bad, everything lies within that. So it's not you know binary one way or the other. Two is the always thinking ant. They're thinking in um, absolutes. I like to use the quote for any Star Wars nerds out there. Only Sith speak in absolutes. That's what Obi-Wan said. And Sith are the bad guys, if you didn't know of that movie. <clears throat> but they're always using terms like always, never, no one, everyone. Again, that's on those binary terms. And there's a huge gray area, which everybody falls into. There's the focusing on the negative. They only see the bad in this situation. This is kind of one of the polar sides of that second ant but um, it's uh, the more negative side of that ant, which can be very detrimental for our mental health as well as physical. There's the fortune telling ant, which is uh, they always predict the worst possible outcome. You know, um, I could go, oh, we're gonna go out for breakfast. Oh, well, traffic's gonna be bad. You know, just negative things that don't necessarily impact the greater scheme of what your goal is um, for certain types of activities. There's the mind reading ant. These are the ones that look at other people and they, they assume that they know how they feel, <clears throat> even though you haven't even asked or they haven't told you how they feel. Um, a lot of the times, this is what people project onto others, what they think of themselves. And there's other ways that we can address this as well. Uh, there's the thinking with your feelings, and there's, that's believing only negative feelings and you never even question them. Again, it's about that big interoception thing I've been talking about with the one page miracles. You gotta know why, why is something triggering you? 
There's the guilt beatings. In other words, should, must, ought, or had to. This is when no matter what you do, no matter how you address the situation, you're always going to tell yourself there was a better way. And that's not always bad because that's a good way to improve ourselves. But when you're using terminology such as, you know, have to or should have, sometimes you may um, beat yourself down instead of using it as a tool to bring yourself up. And then there's the labeling ant. This is, uh, goes with a few other ants that I've discussed, but it's attaching a negative label uh, to yourself or even someone else. Uh, this is, again, that introspective uh, feelings of yourself that you may project onto the world or uh, assumptions you make of others. And then there's the blaming ant, the blame someone else for all the problems you have. Now, there's certain things uh, we can blame that we have no control over, such as the pandemic. That's something that uh, none of us could really you know, control. We can do our things and do our part to improve it for everybody, but um, we can't blame it on everybody else around us because it's a problem that the whole world is facing. Now we got to talk about killing these ants. So now once you discover what the ants you are and you, you know, you've listened to which ant is which, um, there's also explanations in the packet of each ant. Um, whatever one you relate to, write it down. We're going to identify which type of ant it falls under within those nine ants. And then we're going to talk back to it. We're going to challenge that thought. It's, in, it's that interoception that I've been talking about. You're going to make that thought. If it's a negative, why am I making that negative thought? Is there something positive out of this? And it's just a thought process that's going to improve um, just your perspective on uh, certain things you think about in life, automatic negative thoughts. So we're gonna go for good enough. We don't need to be perfect all the time. The second thing I wanna talk about is eating better. So we're gonna talk about how to understand and control our cravings as well as how our cravings affect how our mind works. So first, let me just talk about the difference between physical hunger and emotional hunger. <clears throat> physical hunger is what fills a biological need. This is our actual cells needing either nutrients uh, to produce ATP, which is our energy source for, all, for our bodies, or possibly a micronutrient to uh, work as a coenzyme that helps make the, it's like the, <clears throat> the piece of the car, it's like the key in the ignition that gets the car to go uh, for physical needs. Then there's the emotional eating. This is filling an emotional need, some sort of hole in your life that you're just eating because it's giving you comfort at the time. You're getting that serotonin release. A lot of times when we eat, especially uh, a lot of carby foods, you'll get serotonin release. And it could give you a temporary feeling of feeling good, but it can go away and it will shortly. So we want to be able to control these cravings. Uh, this is an interesting study that talked about the effects of emotional eating and um, obesity. And some of the findings is the possible causes and the main causes um, of emotional eating is dietary restraint. So a lot of times that's those crash course diets that a lot of times don't work or they maybe work temporarily, but then we have that... Um, rebound effect, poor interoception. That's mostly what I'm talking about, really being aware of why we feel the way we feel. Alexithmia, emotional dysregulations, and reverse hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress access. So our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, that's um, our main stress organ. Our, our um, adrenal glands, they sit right on top of our kidneys back here, and our pituitary glands in our brain, and they talk back and forth. And when we're feeling mental stress, it'll send a signal down to those glands in <clears throat> our adrenals and it'll release stress chemicals, cortisol being the main one. I'm sure you guys have maybe heard a little bit about that. I'll get into more of it later. But what they suggest out of this study is that people with emotional eating or depression and poor emotional regulation skills, instead of focusing on calorie restriction, such as losing uh, for like weight loss types of diets, it would be more effective to focus on the emotional aspect on why they're eating. Um, what they're eating and overeating certain things. So that was an interesting study. Some of the differences uh, compared, I wanted to bring this side to side so you can kind of see the difference between emotional versus physical hunger. Um, emotional hunger comes on suddenly. Physical hunger comes on gradually. So I'm sure you guys experience certain times um, where a big life event happens and all of a sudden you just really got to eat something. That's more of that emotional, not that physical. Emotional hunger feels like it needs to be satisfied instantly because it's, it's harsh. It's a bigger hunger pain. Physical hunger, you can wait. You can usually push it off a few days. And they've done studies that look at um, how long organisms can go without eating. And many, uh, even humans, can go you know, a few days without eating. Emotional hunger craves, but not that I'm suggesting you guys do that or anything. Emotional hunger craves specific comfort foods. This is where you're getting those specific 
I want something sugary, you know, I want chocolate, those kind of things. Physical hunger is what your body needs. It wants actual nutrients. Um, emotional hunger isn't satisfied with the full stomach. Again, that's more of a feeling. It's more perception where physical hunger is your actual cells sending the signal, hey, we're full, we're good. Emotional eating triggers feelings of guilt. That's another thing that goes with emotional hunger is a lot of times if we emotionally eat, we get those emotional feelings of guilt afterwards, which perpetuates the problem, which is a vicious cycle that we wanna break. Eating to satisfy physical hunger, it doesn't make you feel bad about yourself. You know you need the nutrients, your body feels happy because you have the nutrients. So just kind of some things that we suggest, some basics um, that we give most of our patients that are looking to improve their health through diet is one thing is intermittent fasting. That's taking a window of time and compressing it when which you will eat. So popular ones that um, are often used is um, like 14, eight. So 14 hours of the day, you're not eating within eight hours, that window, you're going to eat your food. Uh, or 16, eight, I apologize. My math's a little off. And then you can do any kind of which way. Some people will do like a certain day fast. Uh, that's more do your own research and see what works best for you, as well as uh, work with your prov uh, healthcare provider to find out which is the best option. Uh, this is for everybody. Drink half your body weight in ounces of water per day. So just take your body weight, divide it by two. That's how much water you should be drinking in ounces. <clears throat> We wanna stop eating the bad stuff. What's the bad stuff? It's the processed stuff. It's the refined sugars and uh, refined carbohydrates. Natural sugar is good. Fruit is good. We like that kind of stuff. We don't wanna overeat anything at the same time. Uh, so we wanna avoid the bad stuff, alcohol, those kind of things. Think before you drink, soda, caffeine, alcohol. <clears throat> Eat fermented foods. So this one's very, very important. I'm gonna bring up a study a little bit later that talks more about the importance of that. We don't wanna reward ourselves with food, okay? That's gonna affect our dopamine system. When we reward ourselves with certain things that causes a dopamine rush, rewards are good. It acts on the nucleus accumbens in our brain. That's our reward center. What happens though, if you reward yourself after everything, that system starts to dampen and it's not as strong and powerful. So one thing you could do is instead of rewarding yourself with food, hold off and wait to a different reward. <clears throat> Discipline equals more opportunities for that dopamine rush later. We want to practice mindful eating. We want to chew our food. We want to taste our food. We don't want to mindlessly eat in front of the TV. A lot of times that causes overeating. So we want to avoid that. We want to work on the elimination diet, which you're going to see again a little bit later. No anger, no resentment, no worry, no regret or blame. We want to start with one change at a time. And then we want to spiral up instead of spiraling down. So other ways you can feed our emotional hunger. So these are some examples that you guys can start uh, putting into your life um, immediately. So if you're depressed or lonely, call someone that always makes you feel better. Well, it's your best friend, well, it's a family member, or even play with your dog or cat or any other pet that you have. <clears throat> if you're anxious, expend nervous energy by dancing to your favorite song. Everyone loves dancing to music we like. Uh, squeeze a stress ball, that can help. Or taking a brisk walk, something I forgot to add on here. Very simple, we can do it right now as a little experiment. If you're feeling a little anxious, what I want you to do is we're gonna do what's called a physiological sigh. So based on our physiologically, if you breathe in, that actually increases our heart rate. It's gonna build up that anxiety a little bit. But if you breathe out, that's gonna slow down our heart rate. So if we can have our exhales longer than our inhales, we can actually slow down our heart rate and give us a sense of calm within our brains and our bodies. So a uh, physiological sigh, you may see your animals do it all the time. I like when my dog does it, it's really cute. She does it when she's about to fall asleep. But what it is, is you're gonna inhale twice. You're gonna then just exhale. So you can give that a try. It should calm you down. If you have a little heart rate monitor you can look at, you should see your heart rate drop too, it's pretty cool. So if you're exhausted, what you can do is treat yourself with a hot cup of tea. Um, tea's got low levels of caffeine and it also has other compounds in it that can raise alertness. Uh, take a bath, uh, light some scented candles or wrap yourself in a warm blanket. Cold is also very effective. If you can just um, expose yourself to a little bit of cold, cause a little bit of shiver, uh, that'll wake you up and bring some uh, more focus into. Another thing you can do <clears throat> is you can look up. Raising your eyes actually does bring up more focus. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We'll talk about stuff going on in the brainstem. If you're bored, that means you got to do something that you enjoy. Read a book, watch a comedy show, explore the outdoors. Just do anything you really like. You know, some people like working with their hands. Some people like to make music. Um, a lot of times being creative is one of the best things we can do when we're bored. So here's that elimination diet again. Remove your anger, regret, worry, resentment, guilt, and blame. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about our second brain. That's our gut. So that's our second brain. So this is our serotonin producing machine. 90% of serotonin that's produced in our bodies comes from our gut actually, which is uh, not well known. And that's where all our microbiome is. To. So that's all the little bugs that live with inside us. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we have our own world inside us full of uh, many different organisms. And what you want is you want to have diversity. You wanna have as many different types of bacteria as possible. So we wanna feed them. And what are we gonna feed them? We're gonna feed them fermented foods. That's what our bacteria in our gut like. That's what uh, they feed off of. And that's what gives all the beneficial compounds produced to us. Uh, examples of fermented foods, pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickled beans, kombucha. There's many others. Every culture has their um, own fermented food. So um, you know, that's a simple Google search. You can find many others and find out what works best for you. And then this brings me to this study. This study actually came out last week. So this is very, very new. Or maybe it was two weeks ago. It was very, very recent. But what they looked at was it was kind of an experimental study where they would just wanted to look at different types of diets and how they affect our microbiome. And I put the highlights here. And the main one I want to focus on, so there's diet intervention systems profiling reveals links to diet microbiome immune access. So obviously there is a link directly to our immune system, which is important with the pandemic going on, as well as our microbiome, which has to do with what we eat and uh, what we feed our bodies with. Uh, what they found, high fiber diet changes microbiome function and elicits personalized immune responses. Okay, we expected that. The cool thing and my favorite thing about this study is they looked at fermented foods diet and that's what increased the microbiome diversity. And that's what we really want is that microbiome diversity because that's what decreases those markers of inflammation and that improves our mental as, phys as well as physical health. They actually compared that to the high fiber diets and the people that consumed two to three servings of the fermented foods that we went over earlier did better. They had more diversity than those really high fiber diets. Although the high fiber had a greater number of organisms, the diversity is what's important. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about movement. So first, um, this study was really, really cool. They looked at exercise and compared it to the effects of Zoloft. And what they actually found was exercise um, completely mimics the effects of uh, Zoloft after four months or up to four months. And then afterwards, it has an even longer lasting effect that improves uh, the effects of Zoloft if you are taking it too. So even if you are on any type of medication, exercise is going to improve the efficacy of that medication. Really cool study. Uh, this book I wanted to bring up because this has to do um, with exercise and how it can improve our cognitive function. So this was the book Spark, Spark uh, written by John Wrighty. He's a medical doctor. And this, um, he actually looked at students in Naperville, Illinois. They have something that's called Zero Without Our PE. And they would perform physical exercise before the school day would start. And then what they did was they looked at their test scores and things like that and compared it to other individuals that weren't performing it. And uh, the ones that were doing the PE before school, everything was way up higher. Um, they did perform well in all aspects of cognition, as well as uh, were close to the top national rankings in uh, math, science, and uh, reading. So again, it proves, and it does this by improving cognitive function and maintaining brain volume. So it causes this um, compound called BDNF. It's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, some say that it actually creates new neurons, but that's actually not true. What it does is it increases the plasticity of neurons, which allows uh, the brain to communicate in different ways that is more efficient and more beneficial uh, for the organism using it. So where do we start with exercise? So the American College um, of... Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, uh, the recommendations that the national government goes off of is 30 minutes of moderate to light activity a day. Now, most of us don't actually get this. Well, many Americans, um, we want to get this, but we just don't have the time because of other things, but we have to make the time. And we mainly want aerobic exercise is the most important if we're going to go by this 30 minute mark. Really, it depends on, we need, this is the bare minimum. Uh, that I would suggest to somebody, but it really depends on your goals uh, physically. If you want to improve muscle mass, uh, balance, uh, athletic performance, or improve even cognitive function, uh, talk to some sort of professional, such as a doctor, that uh, can prescribe you a more specific exercise program for you. <clears throat> these, I'm going to talk a little bit about certain activities. So these are brain-specific activities that will improve our uh, 
some are physical activities that'll improve different regions of our brain. Some are mental activities that can improve different regions of our brain. So I'll talk a little bit about what region we're focusing on. If you relate to that, like, oh, I have a little bit of, um, like for frontal lobe, for example, that is um, our executive function type of lobe. That tells us what we're gonna do with all our motor control and things like that. Uh, if you have a lot of anxiety, a lot of times it's frontal lobe inhibition and we wanna bring that up. So if you relate to any of these things, any of these regions that I go to, try some of these exercises and it might improve some of those. So frontal lobe, it's uh, impulse control, organization, planning, judgment. And again, it controls our motor movements. If I wanted to reach towards that, that's all my frontal lobe going off. Things that can affect the frontal lobe, mental um, activities we can do is crossword puzzles, word games, meditation has been really good for calming everything down as well as hypnosis. And I'll give you guys a hypnosis research later that we can do as well as a meditation resource. The limbic system, this is our emotional brain. So <clears throat> it's in charge of the sensory information that inputs and makes an association with an emotion. Sometimes if you smell something, it'll bring up a past memory. A lot of that's due to the limbic system. So things that we can do to improve that is killing those ants, the autonomic negative thoughts, practice that, and that can improve our emotional response to different stimuli. Basal ganglia, this has to do with our volitional movement uh, as well as non-volitional movement. Um, it's kind of like our movement pattern. So walking, we develop that over time, throwing a baseball, even certain dance moves, that's all controlled in the basal ganglia circuits. Uh, and follows motivation as well. And yeah, again, smooth movement, like handwriting, other things. Also, it senses emotional and physical pain, which is more uh, recent research. So things we can do to improve our basal ganglia's health is deep relaxation, hand warming techniques, and diaphragmatic breathing. So that breathing technique, the physiological side, is a good way to access that diaphragmatic breathing, and that can help calm down and reduce some anxiety. Temporal lobe. So this is associated with language, uh, music, sound. It's close to our ears. A lot of stuff associated with hearing is uh, located in the temporal lobe. So a lot of things, and it's uh, also very associated with memory as well. So things we can do for the temporal lobe health, memory games, naming games, singing is one of the best things we can do. You can combine all three with a singing, naming, memory game. That's always a fun thing. And the cerebellum. So cerebellum is mostly known for its unconscious proprioception, where we are at space. If I close my eyes, I still know I'm standing here uh, a couple of feet away from the screen relatively. Um, even though I can't see it. It's my unconscious reception. Um, it also has some to do with uh, cognitive function as well. That's uh, more new research that's been coming out. But things we can do to help that is handwriting. It's also good with fine motor control as well as calligraphy. The parietal lobe. So this is our somatosensory uh, cortex of our brain. This is what integrates all the information coming from our environment, from our bodies, from the outside, from even internal organs and it's making sense of it into the brain. Things we can do to this, juggling, you're, off, you're focusing on the balls moving constantly as well as the feeling of it in your hand, as well as interior design. So here's more physical activities that can affect those lobes as well. So I already explained a little bit about the frontal lobe. Things we can do that really help this is aerobic exercise. This is gonna increase that blood flow and that dopamine that we like. Dopamine again is that motivation. Um, <clears throat> It can also improve our impulsivity because improved blood flow to that is gonna improve the health of that. And it's gonna decrease our impulse, um, especially when combined with meditation, hypnosis, those such things. Yoga is also very good because it brings in sort of that meditative aspect. The limbic system, that's the emotional brain. Another thing, aerobic activities that are social. So if you're gonna run, run with a friend, you could dance, join a sports team, lots of different things. We wanna bring that social aspect in with the physical movement. Basal ganglia, uh, again, this is our movement pattern control, yoga, tai chi, overactivity in the basal ganglia, calm anxiety. Also, um, dancing would be very good. Like anything you're learning, like a physical move is very good for the basal ganglia. And doing it with friends is always improving it. Temporal lobe, again, with the sound, memory, everything. Inter issues with the temporal lobe. So this is going to, anything that involves music. This is a big dancing one, listening to music, singing. Uh, all that's going to help improve temporal lobe health. And then the cerebellum, unconscious proprioception, a little bit of cognition. Dancing, again, table tennis, it's a lot of that fine motor control. And um, any really coordinated exercise is gonna be mediated through the cerebellum. So that's gonna improve that health. On to my next topic is sleep better. This one is, could be arguably the most important in my opinion. So sleep is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And 
you know, back a long time ago, sleep was kind of thought almost as a weakness. So who needs sleep? I got plenty of time to sleep when I'm dead. That's simply just not true. Um, you need sleep. You do. And everybody's different. Some people may need six hours of sleep. Some people may need nine hours of sleep. Um, and there is such a thing as too much sleep as well. So at least 50% of the U.S. population is chronically sleep deprived. That's from reports. I bet it's even higher than that because a lot of us don't report it because we don't think we need that much sleep. And minimal sleep loss can have negative effects on all of these things, mood, cognition, performance, productivity, communication skills, accident rates, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, and immune system. That's a lot of stuff. So when we sleep, a big thing that happens is all of our neurotransmitters, all that waste that builds up during the day, <clears throat> in our bodies, what happens is it goes through our blood and then it goes to our liver and our liver takes care of it and we excrete waste. Our brain doesn't do that throughout the day. It only removes its waste while we sleep. So if we're not getting the proper sleep, we're containing different uh, chemicals and compounds in our brains that could be deleterious to our health, mind, and uh, psychology. So let's talk about some long-term effects of sleep deprivation, immune system failure, and diabetes. It does have a very close association with insulin resistance, cancer, obesity, that goes with the insulin resistance as well, depression. You're not recycling those neurotransmitters. You're not getting that dopamine and serotonin to uh, get broken down and rebuilt up to, so you can use it again. Memory loss, that's also with the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine being a main, main one of those. Low libido, you age faster, increases perception of pain. Not good stuff, guys. So some tips that we can do to sleep better. No screens two hours before bed. We need to schedule a wind down period, at least two hours before. And I would like you to perform a certain activity, whether it's reading, meditation, breath work, um, a lot of the things that we're talking about today that can help calm us is really good to put into your sleep routine, which will help you fall asleep. Just a little bit about positions. Since I'm a chiropractor, I work with the musculoskeletal system. We always like to talk about what's the proper sleeping position. I get that question all the time. And what we would say the best is that very top one on your back. We're not rotating our head in any way. And we have a nice um, pillow underneath our knees to relieve stress on our low back. Uh, that's going to relieve a lot of the tightness in that posterior chain, those muscles. Um, side lying is also good. And this picture is great. He's got a pillow in between his hips and the pillow underneath his head is shoulder to ear width. So he's not rotating. He's not laterally bending any which way. So his spine is in a neutral position and you can sleep comfortably like that. The middle one, we don't like that. You have to turn your head and you're not getting very good oxygen. And we need oxygen for all our cells to function properly. So a little bit of pre-sleep routines. And I also want to throw in the most important thing about sleep. I forgot to make a slide on that. So I'm going to add it in here and just tell you guys about it is when you get up in the morning, you got to get daylight. When you get that sunlight, when it goes into your eyes, you have these melanopsin cells in your eyes. Those sense that light and that starts your circadian clock. That starts when um, your body's going to tell yourself later, okay, we got to street some melanin and uh, our melatonin and then fall asleep. <clears throat> so getting light first thing in the morning is imperative if you want to have a regular sleep schedule. And then we want to go to sleep at the same time about every day, wake up about the same time every day. Again, that's a biological clock. It goes on for 24 hours. So just some things you can do for the routine. Routine is take a warm bath at night. Actually, when you heat your body up, it makes your body more warm compared to the outside environment. So you're going to feel colder, which helps initiate sleep because you need to have a temperature drop to actually fall asleep. Meditate, a uh, great way to calm down the brain. We'll give you some stuff on that. Reading a book. What's cool about reading a book is you're actually, a lot of times you're gonna be looking down like that. I mentioned earlier, if you're looking up, that's actually gonna increase focus, increase cognition. And looking down is gonna do the exact opposite. The reason is behind this is the areas of our brain and our brain stem that controls eye movement is close to the nucleus ceruleus, which is associated with our sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to um, have us calm down based on which way we're looking. So give that a try too. It's a pretty cool effect. Another thing, the thing we can do is listen to soft music. Again, it's just something to calm us down, make us feel good. And you can also try essential oils. Um, we, we can talk later about which kinds to get. Um, lavender is a very good one. And then also you could also just rub lavender on the bottom of your feet. <clears throat> another good thing is if we are over here, oh yeah, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Is that okay? Um, another good thing with, uh, if you are really hot, if you need to cool yourself off really fast, if you have a cold glass, 
next to you, you can just grab it with your hand. So our palms and the bottom of our feet and also the top of our face have what's called venous anostomies. That's where arterias and veins kind of meet up and they skip the whole capillary part, blah, blah, blah. But anyways, that's where we dissipate heat from our bodies. So if you grab onto something cold, that will cool your whole body faster than something like, let's say, a cold rag on the back of your neck. So now we're going to talk about feeling better with a pain-free lifestyle. So 80% of Americans will experience back pain. I chose back pain because I'm a chiropractor. That's what I see uh, most often on a daily basis. This back pain lasts anywhere from two weeks or longer and uh, at least 80% experience sometime in their life. So I'm sure some of you in here have experienced it as well as some at home. So what we wanna do is we wanna reduce stress because again, stress and pain are very closely associated with one another. We also wanna reduce the inflammation and joint pain. So we wanna tell we wanna find out where's the fire and then we wanna put out that fire. <clears throat> and sustained stress equals prolonged pain. And it does that through the cortisol response as well as that sympathetic activation of our nervous system. So this is a little bit of research about um, stress and how it actually changes our perception of pain. This study over here looked at um, <clears throat> the biopsychosocial perspective on back pain and its treatment. And this other one over here showed, looked at mindfulness and self-efficacy in the pain perception. And um, pretty much what these studies tell us is that that first one is there's a physiological change that happens with our psychology when we're experiencing pain and it goes both ways it's a two-way street the second one more looked at mindfulness meditation practice certain things like that and how it can actually change these pathways to reverse those bad deleterious effects that uh, we could have uh, based on stress so those are some interesting studies so again, stress and chronic pain, it's a cycle. They're closely associated and we need to break it. So our fight or flight response, that's that sympathetic nervous system response. That's what I've been talking so much about. And a lot of it's short-term stress, but it can lead to long-term stress and long-term health effects. <clears throat> so yes, again, we get stuck in that fight or flight response. And a lot of times that's where we're experiencing those chronic pain symptoms. So our autonomic nervous system, you got cortisol, that's that, um, that's that hormone that's getting released from those glands right above the kidneys and it's fight or flight. So evolutionary, we developed this in order to escape from a bear, tiger, anything that's chasing you that might uh, cause harm to you or your family. So it's a good response, but the problem is our brains now don't know how to interpret the difference between a bear chasing me versus my bills being due the next day. So we interpret it as we're getting, uh, it's a life-threatening event. So when stress is a part of the nervous system, yeah, it controls things like blood pressure that's directly with the sympathetic nervous system. And uh, it's really to prepare your body to go into action. That's why it's fight or flight. Cortisol, it's important anti-inflammatory hormone. It's good in small doses and in the correct uh, expression of it. It prevents widespread tissue and nerve damage that is associated with inflammation. That's good stuff. Too much of it is bad. When cortisol is released for too long, it's... Um, increases our blood glucose, increases inflammation in the area, brings inflammatory cytokines, and uh, can cause um, symptoms of pain, as well as muscle tightness, hypertonicity, things like that. So it's the main stress hormone. Under ideal circumstances, it's released naturally in a diurnal pattern. This is another reason why that sunlight in the morning is so important. It's gonna send that signal from the, to the brain, to the pituitary gland, to tell those adrenal glands, secrete cortisol in the morning, we're waking up, we need to be alert, and then die down at night so we can fall asleep. <clears throat> so acute versus chronic stress, fight or flight versus the prolonged cortisol release. So that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, bear chasing you versus taxes, social media, you name it, uh, pandemic on the uh, chronic kind of prolonged release. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna increase blood sugar. I mentioned that that's the main function. And that's actually gonna increase our memory and attention because our brain runs on sugar. So when we increase that, it's gonna improve it. That's why it's supposed to release in the morning to wake us up. <clears throat> it's also gonna increase our blood pressure. It's gonna decrease our sensitivity to pain in an acute setting. It's gonna decrease our serotonin levels. Serotonin actually makes us sleepy. So normally in the morning when we release it, we don't wanna be sleepy. So that's one of the reasons like that. And it's gonna suppress our immune system. And I already mentioned the increasing blood sugar. So this is all kind of the short-term normal response. This is the basic uh, actions of cortisol. When it's prolonged, 
it will increase that blood sugar, can cause symptoms of diabetes, insulin resistance, weight gain because of that sugar. If we don't use the sugar, it turns into fat. Um, it can reduce muscle mass. You can reduce memory because when we're constantly cognitively functioning at a high level, there's a rebound effect. So you're not going to keep those neurotransmitters up for memory and things like that. It's going to suppress our immune system. It's going to increase the aging process. It's going to affect our hormones. It's going to increase testosterone in women. And it's actually going to decrease it in men. And that's also related. Those adrenal glands have to do, they secrete those uh, sex hormones in both men and women. And it's going to increase risk of substance abuse, which is a pretty interesting study um, that studies have shown. So what we can do, something we do in our office is we do cortisol saliva testing. It's a four times per day test because again, we want cortisol to be high in the morning and then we want it to slowly go down throughout the day. So we have to do it multiple times a day to see if it's elevated multiple times a day because we want it to have the proper response. Cortisol is good at the right times. <clears throat> this is an example of how it's supposed to look. So in the morning, you can see it's high and this is optimal. The green is optimal and the yellow is suboptimal. So we still don't even want it to be too, too high in the morning because that could have uh, poor health effects. So we want it to still kind of slowly drift off during the day, but we don't want it to be too high or too low at any point. Again, stress equals pain. It's closely associated. Oh, nope, that's right. A little bit about pain. So I threw this in here just because I am a chiropractor and we deal with pain on a daily basis. And a lot of these, um, a lot of individual stress contributes to their pain. So we address that in my office. And the cost of pain is very, very high. It's $635 billion if, to us nationally on a national level. So we're all paying for that to some degree. The main way we're treating pain a lot of times in the medical offices is with opioids. Uh, they block the pain symptoms, but unfortunately they're very addictive and they can cause substance abuse problems in many individuals. 41 people die every day uh, from overdosing on prescription opioids. So we wanna reduce that. Um, in my profession, we are trying to do a big part in this by reducing people's pains without uses of drugs or surgery based on lifestyle things. Um, this is just a chart showing how Opioids, synthetic opioids, uh, legal street drugs have just, uh, the deaths have increased exponentially over the years. And uh, it's just recently that we're finally starting to see legislation kind of step in and try to reduce uh, these amount of deaths and the amount of prescriptions of opioids that are going on. 60% of Americans take drugs. That's more than any country in the world. Think back to that question I asked earlier, are we a sick or a healthy country? If we're 60% of taking us drugs, we might be more on the sick side. And we're also ranked 37th in the world for healthcare. That's not what we like to see. America likes to be number one. So our drugs the answer. I'll let you guys answer that. Our response to deal with this kind of uh, all these issues around the opioid epidemic, chronic pain symptoms, stress, all that kind of goes into one. Uh, we take a look at the muscles. Muscles and joints work together. We work on the bones. We do chiropractic adjustments. We also do soft tissue therapies as well as movement therapy is my kind of specialty is um, proper movement, how to work, uh, how to exercise and how to move properly to avoid injury and uh, to stay healthy. So in order to be ready for action, your muscles will be tightened and overworked during chronic stress. That's another effect of this cortisol always being elevated. You're, you know, I'm sure you guys can relate when our shoulders come up and we get really tight traps and then our necks feel tight. It's due to that stress. And this can cause pain. This was a cool study. I just saw this. This came out within the last uh, year, uh, 2020. And they actually looked at the comparison and the cost of low back pain for physical therapy versus chiropractic. And what was really cool about this is chiropractic actually was more um, economically advantageous. They, there was a lower cost to effect ratio than PT. So PTs are great. I'm not trying to like knock on physical therapy for any ways. Uh, I refer patients to physical therapy if they need it. Uh, but again, it, chiropractic is very good at reducing symptoms of pain uh, without drugs or surgery. <clears throat> Some things you should be aware of. These are the warning signs uh, that maybe you do need to come see a professional such as myself or a physical therapist. If you're getting neck pain, if you're getting headaches, especially constant headaches, chronic headaches, they're not going away, new types of headaches, jaw pain, a lot of, this is your TMJ, your temporomandibular joint, a lot of TMJD, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, uh, that can also increase headaches, neck pain, it's all, um, all the muscles in our jaw are actually inserting into our neck. 
there's arm pain, grip strength radiating. If you notice you're not as strong in the grip, grip strength is one of the best indicators of a long lifespan. So we wanna have good grip strength as well as leg strength. And then radiating pain, that's pain that's traveling. So if you have a pain that goes from your neck all the way down to your fingers, come see us. We need to take a look at that. If you have sciatica symptoms, pain going down the back of your leg into your feet, that's something we can help with as well. We work on muscle spasms, cramping. If you're constantly having spasms, it could be due to biomechanics. It could be due to overworking. It could be due to diet. It's our job to find out. We'll take a history and we'll figure out what's going on. Numbness, tingling, burning, that goes with that radiating symptoms a little bit. If you're experiencing any of those, those are neuro neurological pain. Um, so it has something to do with our nervous system that we work with uh, directly. Mid-back pain, tightness, those kind of things. Decreased range of motion. If you can't turn your head very far, or extend or look down, you know, if you're having trouble reading your book uh, or going down the stairs because you can't bend your neck to look down at the stairs, that's something to be aware of that we can help. So there's new guidelines from the American College of Physicians that actually recommend starting with conservative treatments such as chiropractic care, acupuncture, massage, physical therapy before turning to drugs or surgery. The things with drugs or surgery is you can't undo those. <clears throat> Once you have a surgery, the surgery is done. So we wanna take a conservative approach, try to get you out of pain as best as possible, take what improvements we can get. And uh, based on that, if we're not getting better, then we may consider something like drugs or surgery, but always you wanna go with that conservative option because it's best for your health overall. So what we recommend at McLaughlin Care is a stepped care approach. We, we recommend chiropractic um, therapy. It's gonna get things moving. It's gonna get joints moving, joints that haven't moved in a long time. And that's gonna initiate the process of you physically moving yourself. So we always wanna do that. And cause then we can go into movement therapy such as rehab exercise. Again, that's my specialty. That's in my wheelhouse. Um, I like to examine patients. I'll give you a quick demonstration. So a squat, for example, I always perform the overhead squat when I'm analyzing a patient's movement and I'll have them place their hands overhead and just have them go into a squat. And I'm paying attention to certain things because based on the way their movement, if their arms are falling forward, that's telling me there's something in the shoulder that's going on that's affecting their squat. Uh, if a knee drops in, if there's any shifting any which way, it tells me what's going on within their bodies, what muscles are working, which uh, are overworking, which are underworking. And then I can address that, get them moving better. They can start exercising, feeling better. And when you exercise, you get those endorphins. That improves that stress. Uh, we do anti-inflammatory diets and supplements. Uh, we do functional medicine in my office. And what that is, is we'll take blood, we'll do a blood sample, we'll do advanced testing, look at different markers. And based on those markers and your genetics, we will give you <clears throat> supplements and lifestyle recommendations that will improve those markers and which will improve your overall health. There is massage. We have a massage therapist. Massage is great for tight muscles. Uh, muscle spasm and just pain in general acupuncture acupuncture is great for chronic pain uh, that works on that sympathetic nervous system directly it actually you have these little uh nuclei which are kind of the brains of the cell located all down your spine on each side and it's been shown that uh, acupuncture directly has an effect on those nuclei and it can be very effective for some individuals to reduce pain and again that last resort we're looking at medication their side effects you know watch a commercial this, 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 uh, you know, just to get rid of one symptom, pain clinic consultation, injections and surgeries. We wanna avoid those if all, all possible and spiral up. So we're gonna start with one small change at a time. We talked about it earlier. Just pick one thing that we've learned today and incorporate it into our lives. <clears throat> if you, uh, once you incorporate that, let's pick another thing and keep moving forward, okay? This is an example of uh, a blood test that we do um, for functional medicine. I just wanted to show you it so you kind of have an idea uh, of what it would look like. And the, basically the red is bad, the green is good, the yellow is kind of in the middle. Our goal is to look at those markers that are red, provide either supplement or lifestyle recommendations, whatever works best for that individual to move that uh, towards the left to get on that green side. Because those green is the optimal ranges that we like. And then this is a sample of the supplement case that we provide to our patients. Um, it's really, really great because instead of having a whole pharmacy in your kitchen where you're taking this pill at that time and this pill at that time, it comes in these little packets. It'll say morning, midday, afternoon, um, evening, and you can just take it. That's when you take your supplements. Uh, it's directly written by the uh, pr pr uh, physician. So those are really awesome. And then we're going to go for good enough, guys. Again, pick one thing, go for good enough. And 
Once we feel good in that aspect, we'll move on to the next. It's a dangerous belief that nothing can be done. There's always something. Keep that in mind. And I want you guys to think, what is your dangerous belief that is holding you back? Because we all have them. That's what these ants are for. That's what that one page of miracle is for. So you can have that interoception, know why you're feeling the certain way you do about that certain stimuli and learn how to address it and move forward. So this is our motto for Dr. McLaughlin and myself. It's we are here for you because our sole focus is to improve the quality of life and health for every person we encounter. So I'm hoping that you guys learned something good today. And we want you to be proactive with your health. This is just a little infograph that kind of shows you some of the stuff we do for the musculoskeletal pain needs. We got a lot of chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, infrared sauna is also very good. Many health benefits, that's another topic. We do laser like lipo body contouring. That's for more of the aesthetic purposes if you're looking to lose weight, we do that as well. Um, history and complete exam, we do a very thorough history. If you come in with a complaint, we're gonna analyze that complaint. We're gonna figure out what's causing the complaint. We're not gonna try to cover up the symptoms. We're gonna hit the root cause and deal with that and treat it. And then we have weight loss. It's called Begin With Wellness Weight Loss. You can do that anywhere, virtually all over the country, or you can come to our office and do it in person too. And then again, the blood test and functional medicine, uh, that helps all aspects of health. It really improves all our biomarkers and uh, optimizes us uh, for long, healthy lives. So Emily, will you pass these out? I do have a special offer to give you guys for showing up. I really appreciate everyone coming to learn and... Um, even the ones that are at home, those individuals. So our special offer we're gonna do has to do with the stress. So that first one is the wellness workup. That's basically gonna be that history and exam to figure out what's going on with you specifically. We also do that neurotransmitter and cortisol testing. It's a spit test. And sometimes we'll offer a urine test depending on which one we wanna do, depending on your history. And then the consultation to the doctor to go over those results we get from those tests. Um, the lab work we do, we look at nine different neurotransmitters. We look at inhibitory neurotransmitters and we look at excitatory neurotransmitters. What we want is a nice balance of these transmitters. If one's high, those excitatory neurotransmitters, a lot of times we're feeling very anxious. If those uh, inhibitory ones are very high, a lot of times those are bringing on uh, symptoms of depression and things like that. What we want to do is bring it down to the, to the balance. And then what we normally see is those symptoms kind of just subside on their own once the neurotransmitter and the blood work is in order. <clears throat> we also do a posture assessment. Posture actually has a very um, close relationship with our blood chemistry. So for example, if we're sitting like this all the time, try to take a deep breath, it doesn't feel very good. Can't get very much air in, that's gonna affect our blood oxygen content. If we stand up straighter, take a deep breath in, you can get a lot more oxygen that's gonna give, uh, go to your cells and provide energy and um, allow us to function properly and optimally. That's our first offer, that's 347 off of 520, so that's a pretty good deal. And then our wellness workup and a consultation with the doctor. This isn't going to do the neurotransmitter and cortisol testing, but it will look at those biomarkers of health. Um, it'll have the complete history exam. We're also gonna provide the risk assessment where you'll fill it out and that's gonna determine at what risk are we at developing a cardiovascular disease in the future. And again, that's gonna have the posture pain as well as the consultation. And then we have a free ebook we wanna give you guys. Uh, it's just supposed, to, it's a stress no more. It's general information, kind of similar today on how to reduce your stress and how stress is affecting your lives and how we can improve uh, those types of aspects of our lives. So always remember, it was always better together. So make an appointment for a friend or family. I don't want, the offer is not just for you guys. If you have any friends or family that you think could benefit from some of this information or from seeing um, us in the office for musculoskeletal pain, stress, <clears throat> weight loss, any of, the, uh, any of the things I've talked about previously, uh, send them our way and we can help them. That offer is totally good for them as well. Nice little picture. So what's next? Call or make your appointment. Do it for someone you love if you uh, feel inclined, and then we'll start your journey to become the optimal, healthiest version of yourself because we have nothing to lose but our own health. And that's our most important investment. 
uh, please, if you would, give us a follow if you're on Facebook. That's our Facebook group. It's called Upside of Wellness. We're always posting um, a Wellness Wednesday where we're going to talk about some aspect of health, certain things we do in the office. Sometimes it's just a fun video just to entertain. Um, but we post a lot of good information about health and what we can do for you guys um, there. And then I just want to say again, thank you guys. Um, it's great having an audience, finally being able to talk to people in person. I hope you guys learned something new today, and I hope that we can take some of this information and incorporate it into our lives to improve our own lives. All right. So any questions after that? There are times where I would like to sort of do a fast break. Okay. So I can give you a pretty good answer on that. So Medicare is very consistent because uh, they're a governmental entity. What they cover for chiropractic is the adjustment. And they are very good about covering the adjustment. They don't cover other modalities such as maybe we wanna do some electric muscle stimula stimulation on you. Um, the examination, unfortunately, they don't cover either. And um, other things like x-rays, they don't cover. But if you're getting sent to a lab, a lot of times the lab will be able to bill Medicare in which that would get covered. But uh, from a chiropractic standpoint, they're currently only covering the adjustment. But there is currently legislation in effect that we're trying to get them to cover everything else that we do. Mm -hmm. So we're working on it, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Okay. I actually just wrote a letter to the congressman uh, this past week. So hopefully that helps. <laughs> Another question? Scented things on your feet. <clears throat> so, so that's due not necessarily for as much as the smell point because it's all the way by your feet. Why wouldn't you put it under your nose, right? Uh, that's because you actually have receptors on your feet that senses those <clears throat> uh, different sort of chemicals and things like that. And then those have physiologic, physiological responses within your nervous system. So it's, we're not surely, we're not for, fully sure on the exact mechanisms of why it helps, but it does have to do with the neuro, neurology and the receptors that are located on your feet and palms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it. Mm -hmm. There are certain, mm -hmm. there are certain, uh, so our feet, especially our hands too, are full of all these different mechanoreceptors and different mechanoreceptor stimulation will have a different response in the body. Uh, for example, I'm not trained in acupuncture, but Dr. McLaughlin is, so I can't use that, but a trigger point I can use. So trigger points are little muscle knots that kind of form in our body and they have referral patterns. So let's say a, very, a really common one is one in the calf. You can push on that it can actually cause low back pain and if these are actually the cause if they're activated some of these trigger points if you treat that you get that trigger point out the back pain will actually subside because again the back pain wasn't being generated and that's one of our jobs as a chiropractor is to find out what's generating that pain so we can treat that so not only the symptoms go away but they don't come back and we know how to treat it in the future so that's kind of an example that's pretty cool but yeah any other questions if anyone on Zoom has a question, you can raise your hand as well, and I can promote you so you can talk with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bottoms of your feet. Yeah, because those are, um, they're called venous anostomies. That's where arteries and veins, they kind of come together. So normally our arteries are carrying oxygen to our cells and then the veins are carrying CO2 back to the lungs so we can exhale it. So we don't build up CO2 in our bodies. <laughs> Even like a water bottle, if you have a cold water next to you, but cold pad would work great. Uh, we don't want it to be too cold, but like kind of like a, like a cold glass of water generally is pretty good. Um, it's pretty cool. So they've done experiments on athletes where they're exercising. And um, when you overheat, 
it causes this enzyme called pyruvate kinase to actually be deactivated. And you need that in order to produce energy to continue doing work. So let's say I was doing bicep curls and I'm so exhausted, I can't do anymore. My body's just like, nope, we're done. If I took something cold and grabbed onto it, that would actually get that enzyme activated because I'm dissipating so much heat through my body that the enzyme's activated again, I can start doing those bicep curls again. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's the bottom of the feet, like that thick tissue that uh, on the bottoms of our feet and the palms, and then just the upper part of our face. So mostly like up here, like from up, about nose up. But yeah, that stuff's pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're feeling better. So a lot of that is basically due to, so <clears throat> it feels really good. I've done that myself. I used to play football and I would just dunk water around the back of my uh, neck. It would actually have been more beneficial if I were to grab onto something cold or just put it like a rag on my forehead or dump the water straight on my face. So that's pretty cool that you've actually had that experience a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, time-wise, it's almost instantaneous. It'll it'll start working immediately. Mm -hmm. Just the bottom, like the total bottom. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, like kind of that thick, patty part. I have a question, but I don't know if you want to answer. Let's see. Your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've been therapy for a while, but what I'm experiencing is from like the shoulder blade area on up, it all feels like from here it just goes to the all the way to the head. Is that nerves? It could be. I'd have to do a full examination to actually find that out. It, it might not even necessarily be nerve damage. It'd just be um, the nerve is excitatory right now, and we might need to turn down that signal a little bit. Uh, but uh, I would have to perform a full examination and get your full history to, in order to make that kind of statement. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Of all the tests that you described, mm -hmm. the cortisol, mm -hmm. um, the kind of spit test type thing. Mm -hmm. How much of your body does that affect? Oh, cortisol affects every cell in our body pretty much. Um, so one thing it's going to do is it's going to raise our blood glucose because that's we need glucose in order to, to make energy so we can have that fight or flight response, you know, run from the bear or whatever. That's why it developed within us. <clears throat> so it affects, it has a systemic effect on our entire bodies. Uh, that's why we want to control it because we don't want it to be elevated too much. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Any others? Yeah. Um, as far as sleep goes, I have a lot of problems trying to stay awake when they're driving. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's far as some of the stuff that I try to do to keep myself awake. Do you have any? Just a tip for driving um, off the top of my head. One thing we can do, and this will actually have other benefits in your health, is you can perform isometric contractions. So you can grip your steering wheel. It also can increase your grip strength. That's a big associator of a long lifespan, as well as um, flex your glutes, kind of just like flex them while you're sitting. You may like bob up and down in your chair. That's one good thing. And it's going to strengthen those muscles, which is another plus. So we like that. Another thing I would suggest is remember how I told about looking up is going to increase focus. So if you could maybe just kind of position your head so you're looking up or maybe scoot your chair back. And it's not like we don't want to strain our eyes or anything like that, but just so we have a little bit of a, an upward gaze, that'll increase some of that focus. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and if you're leaning your head back because you are maybe tired, then that's causing your gaze to actually go downward, which could actually excite some of those parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, I hope you guys learned something. Thank you. I think we did. Thank you so much, doctor. Oh, did you hand that out?
Okay, so if you guys are interested in any of these special offers, please uh, go ahead and fill this out and then we can hand it to either Emily or myself before you leave. Um, and also, if you're interested in just more information in the future, you can at least fill out that bottom part so we have your email so we can send you uh, links to our Facebook page as well as other uh, information and certain things we're doing in our office. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Oh, have a great afternoon.